Hello, welcome back. Um, and welcome to the uh, key to the second keynote on the second day, which is given by uh, Professor Pyle Aurora from Erasmus University Rotterdam. She's professor and chair in uh, technology, values, and global uh, media cultures and digital anthropologists. And uh, her talk is on aspirational geographies and hopeful AI futures uh, with the global south. Um, hi, Al, the floor is yours. Thank you, and good to be here. And thank you so much for the invite. Um, I hope everyone can see the screen. Yes, Cornelia? OK. Yeah, we see it well. OK, perfect. All right, let me get started. So firstly, I'm really excited about this theme because it happens to also come at the same time as my book release next spring on this very area, uh, which is basically from pessimism to promise, lessons from the global south on designing inclusive tech. And I speak about aspiration, hope. And so I was very excited to see this theme, uh, to say the least. So um, yeah, um, let me just plunge in and you know share my main argument here. And then looking forward to a bit of a discussion with you all um, is the core of my argument here is that the West is suffering from what I term as pessimism paralysis, yes? Uh, so that is basically a negative bias towards all things digital that can basically derail us from the you know, drive to shift the status quo because negativity by itself has never inspired change. You know, I believe that the future of AI, if steered in the right direction with a sufficient kind of thoughtful guardrails, which are inclusive and responsible, can infuse us with hope, right? Moreover, my other argument here is that the negative bias that is pervasive in the West is due to what I term as a pessimism privilege, sorry, pessimism privilege, which Basically, I define as those who can afford to live with despair, right? So there's pessimism paralysis, which is holding us back, and pessimism privilege, which is allowing us to be in a state of despair. In fact, for those who step outside the West and have engaged with disadvantaged communities, you will resonate with the fact that it is astounding the kind of contagion of hope there is towards things digital, despite the socioeconomic realities and the potentials of digital harms, right? So basically we have forgotten and sidelined nuance and complexity thinking while the binary cults have taken us over. So this is why I'm like basically pushing here for this conversation because what it is, is that it is not naive to be optimistic about our digital future. If anything, it is a moral imperative to design with hope. So I hope I'm able to convince, and I think I may be because of the topic here, but let me uh, move forward and map out the kinds of uphill battles we are facing in the media, in uh, you know, academia and amongst tech gurus, and how do we break out of this pessimism bubble? So, you know, when you look at the ma mainstream headlines with the onset of generative AI and other kinds of AI innovations, there's a real like sort of binary existential questions. Are we doomed? You know, is humanity going to basically be devastated with war and gloom? Um, you know, are we going to become extinct as a species? So these sort of like very black and white uh, sort of questions are being posed to all of us, right? And so you see headlines like uh, artificial intelligence could lead to extinction, says experts, or, you know, uh, killer robots and the future of AI will find us in unholy terror. The future of AI is war. And the problem with these kinds of, uh, you know, a large you know, uh, panic questions is that it derails us significantly from asking the more nuanced questions, starting with the point that AI will be regulated, we'll figure it out. It's not whether or not it will be regulated, whether we can control it or not, but we will do it. We just have to have the momentum and drive and commitment to resolving these issues. Um, 
And it is not a one-off. It's a commitment to an ongoing system of you know, iterative uh, learning with these technologies to ensure they are steered in the right direction. So, um, you know, even the problem with the sort of intellectual dishonesty, even in mainstream media is, uh, you know, can create even more of a distrust and consolidate the binary cult, right? A good case in point is, you know, uh, Francis Hagen's, uh, you know, coverage in the media, right? So many of you already know that uh, the whistleblower from Facebook, uh, sounded the alarm about the way in which Meta was extracting data and also pushing uh, young people into depression. And so it was a very palpable and it went viral across the board. But in the same report, it was also uh, stated that twice the number of young people found solidarity groups on spaces like Instagram, right? Where they felt less lonely. They felt like they were not alone. They were connected. And that was dismissed quite readily because it didn't fit a sort of doomsday narrative about Meta taking over the world and oppressing and pushing us into depression. So this sort of intellectual dishonesty can be weaponized into even consolidating these binary cults further, right? So that's mainstream media. When you come with, you know, come to the tech bros, right? Uh, this is uh, maybe some recognize him. He's uh, Chris Messina, uh, the founder of an inventor of hashtag. Um, and he was actually, many of you may have already watched and even dissected the, uh, so, you know, social dilemma movie. Uh, on Netflix, which got like academics very excited to use it in their classrooms. I'm sure many of you have. So um, it's funny because I have actually been uh, sharing the stage with Chris Messina at a number of festivals in the last year or so alone. Uh, we were at the Copenhagen Tech Festival. We were at the Anda and uh, Tech Festival in, uh, in Belgium and a number of them. And I noticed that he, along with many others on this um, talk circuit of rep uh, repentance, you know, and redemption. So the narrative is such that, oh my God, what have I done? I have created the Frankenstein monster and it's only up to me to fix it because you break it, you fix it, right? So this disproportionate positionality of power that the technology innovators and you know, um, uh, companies are putting onto themselves as if they are the ones who create, they are the ones who uh, regulate, and they are the ones who are going to steer us in the right direction undermines the fact that many of the true solutions to tech problems are social, not technological only, right? So um, that is from, you know, and this is also, by the way, a far cry from the early generation of tech bros, right? They were very optimistic about technologies that it's going to unify us all, you know, uh, it's going to be like, uh, uh, we're going to become one big, big community, regardless of our gender, our race, etc. right? It's going to be true democracy. And uh, so we've sort of like uh, become like really the polar opposite now as technology could destroy democracy and our entire human species coming from the technologists themselves. So we need to capture that moment of, you know, that pivot basically, even in the circle, right? Now, the question is how do we reconcile this with the hashtag movements like Black Lives Matter, Me Too, Occupy? I mean, we go back a decade. So how do you reconcile that these this a simple invention like the hashtag has been also leveraged for positive change and for community and for voice right building and so here again the binary doesn't quite fit isn't it and when we go into academia um you know if you see the books that have come out in the last couple of years it's all about paralyzing us into depression and you know feeling a lot of angst. In fact, it is it is very uh, basically uh, intimidating to criticize any of these books because if you 
if you critique it, and I don't mean critique and by saying that this is not true, but rather by saying that, yes, but there's also nuance, then you're looked upon as someone who is, you know, naive or you're pro-racism or you're pro-capitalism. It's become an either or, right? Pro-colonialism. Um, so, for example, um, the book by Hirsch Loving, who is a claimed pessimist, actually, we, I was there for his latest uh, book launch, uh, Stuck on the Platform, where he says something like, how can billions get rid of something, social media, that they do not even like, are addicted to, and they do not even know how to get rid of? So he starts with this premise that people just want to get out of the platform and they're stuck on the platform because they don't know how to get out of it, right? And that's his latest book. And so when I was there for the launch and you we were positioned as a debater, you know, debate scenario for his book launch, uh, one of the members in the audience asked him saying, you know, so, you know, tell us how, how do we get out of it? Because like how uh, we, we feel paralyzed. I mean, what can we do? And he said, I am afraid in my, my 25 years of being in the tech world and thinking through these and coming up with all these books, it makes me realize that there is no hope. Right. So, uh, I mean, and this is the sort of climate of like nihilism that, What's the point? Now, we have reached a stage, I've tried and tried again, and, and we are completely done for because the platforms have taken over, right? So um, that's one deep sense of melancholy that is pervasive in media scholarship. Uh, if you look at The Cost of Connection, again, I mean, look, these are all good books in their own right. They're powerful messages, right? But we need to also have the opposite, the counter message in order to balance it, because otherwise it can be deeply, uh, you know, uh, dissuasive of our efforts uh, to come up with solutions. So, for example, data colonialism, right, about everything, uh, everything is being extracted, data is being extracted as if that there is little agency in community. Right. And also by imposing the colonialism metaphor, we should be very careful because it is making it seem that digital spaces don't empower us, cannot empower us. And if we think it is empowering us is because we have the colonial mindset that we need to get out of. Right. So, um, you know, this does not necessarily fit with a lot of actual reality. Uh, and empirical evidence coming from the global south, which I will share with you later. So, um, in fact, the age of surveillance capitalism, another beautiful, you know, uh, book, which is actually very powerful and does actually emphasize the commodification, does not mean that this is the be all end all. Like, for example, uh, and I wonder if many of you have actually gone through this. Is I have had PhD students come up to me and say they are. They did empirical work in Vietnam or, you know, uh, one did it in Nigeria and they're like, they struggled because they, uh, you know, their data did not fit the theory. They're like, well, people reported that they really found power in using this digital media. They were really happy in doing, you know, uh, communicating with their loved ones or to be able to uh, uh, move money across board and yada, yada, yada. And so we don't know how to fit it into our surveillance capitalism theory because we have taken it on as our theoretical framework. And so this is where you know the theory is ruling and pushing data to fit it versus the other way around. And it reminds me of when I was a PhD student uh, at Columbia and I uh, remember going to uh, Gayatri's PVAC and I had the same mindset, I said, I love your theory and I really want to make sure that my fieldwork fits your theory. And she said, never do that. Theoretical frameworks are just a way in which you can nudge yourself and to recognize and be intellectually honest with yourself about where you stand. What's your positionality as an academic? Because there's no such thing as neutrality. But when you go into the field, you drop all theory and you allow for honesty of the fieldwork to take over and then re-examine the most sacred, the most beautiful of theories if need be, right? And I took that to heart because it's not easy to go against the grain. And then of course you have the algorithms of oppression, which is about how it is baked into the design, right? 
So if it can be baked in, it can also be taken out. I mean, we know that, you know, AI models are also shaped by the kind of data sets. And there's a lot of effort going on on de-biasing data sets and recognizing that if garbage in is garbage out, then we can actually intervene by putting quality data sets to come up with quality outputs, right? So, you know, th these sort of, uh, and th this is just the tip of the iceberg in academia, right? Because when you go out there, whether it's a conference that I'm at, people feel paralyzed. Ask them to say one nice thing about digital media and you will be afraid because what if you're looked upon as someone who's naive and who's not sco been schooled and doesn't know what you're supposed to say at this point in time, right? So, I mean, look, nuance is looked upon as naivete because you need to have a strong voice. I mean, look, we know the story about bad news is good news, right? I mean, the whole clickbait thing, the simpler the narrative of this is doom and gloom, uh, whether that, you know, tech is oppressing us or, you know, we are going to be paralyzed and uh, we are going to be commodified, then it allows us to have a stronger chance of being cited in academia, to be able to be read in media, to be listened to because you have a strong, simple message to be remembered, right? More books are sold, grants are awarded, doomsday sells basically, right? So, I mean, there's a interesting thing that if you go into, uh, you know, negativity, there's this uh, idea that, you know, associate uh, that pessimism is about associating negativity and hopelessness with a higher degree of intellectual aptitude, as Devrutta Rakshad says, you know. And so, I mean, there is this uh, need to move into that direction because they, pessimism is very alluring. Because if you say, a, as, you know, Matt really said, if you say a catastrophe is imminent, you may expect a MacArthur Genius Prize and the Nobel Peace Prize. Obviously, he's being facetious, but he's like, you can't be nuanced in this day and age because you're looked upon as out of touch, naive, and insensitive. They have even done sort of, um, you know, experiments, which show uh, clinical experiments on people's response to news where there's good news and bad news. And they do respond quicker to words like cancer, bomb, war, than say baby, smile, or fun, right? So, I mean, the reason why pessimism is also very attractive is that it's looked upon as a call to action, while the opposite translates to being happy with the status quo. So if you say something in a nuanced way, then you're like, ah, oh, so you're okay with being uh, uh, with being happy with the status quo, right? So cynicism is basically a measure of maturity and being critical, a sign of objectivity. And that's the sort of overriding uh, driver towards pessimism, right? So the fact though, is that we need to break out of this binary. I mean, and by accepting that the nature of culture is contradiction, right? I mean, um, I'll give you an instance. I was at uh, one of the Ivy League uh, universities last uh, uh, month, uh, talking at um, uh, talking on uh, innovation in the global south, and I was being recorded, and I I said something about how China uh, has managed to come up with. Uh, a counter to Silicon Valley. And it is fascinating that with very limited resources, they were able to come up with these innovations, which are not the copycat nation as was expected, but something new. And it is interesting how the global South entrepreneurs are looking to China versus the West for inspiration because they are looking at how did China crack the code with very limited resources and were able to go against the richest country in the world with extraordinarily deep resources and come up with a counter to Silicon Valley. Now, very quickly after my talk, I was asked if I want to edit that out of the talk because I may be seen as a China lover. So if you say something positive about China, that means you are inadvertently also excusing human rights violations, even in academia. So 
this is the state we're in and is a very dangerous precedent because it's not, we, we don't give the same courtesy to the US. Imagine if every American scholar had to justify and talk about Trumpism, their abortions, the gun violence, every time they speak about, you know, everyday lives on the, in digital spaces. It is crippling, and yet Chinese internet scholars are expected to address authoritarianism for every single study of theirs, right? And so, um, you know, there needs to be nuance, and we should not have the sort of false debate of if I say something good, then thereby I am, you know, taking the full uh, blown, uh, you know, uh, camp that I'm with China or against China, right? Very Bush Bush uh, stand. So. Uh, the courage is often also mistaken for naivete, right? Like so, and because it takes a deep amount of courage to go against the binary, because you know, um, especially younger scholars or emerging journalists, right? It, it it is crippling. But if you look at the evidence, you know, it could be seen as Ukraine being really ridiculously irrational to go against Russia. It seems extremely naive. What are the chances, right? Or for Afghanistani women to go out into the streets when clearly it is formidable and there's a high chance of death and imprisonment. In fact, any kind of political protest in many of the authoritarian regimes seems completely uh, naive, actually. But naivete is courage in this regard because they know fully well, right? what they're getting into, and it's most importantly that they don't believe this is a legitimate choice that they want to continue to be in these environments because they have hope. The sliver of hope is driving them, right? So hope comes when aspirational forces confront oppressive regimes, as Marwan Kredi has brought up with creative insurgencies. It's a quiet kind of hope which happens at the margins. It's a quiet sort of protest. It doesn't have to be in your face necessarily, right? But this kind of algorithmic agency can create social change. So, you know, um, when I came, a couple of years ago, I came out with a book, The Next Million Users. I'm a digital anthropologist and I've spent about two decades looking at how young people use the internet and digital spaces in their everyday settings. And um, I've particularly focused on deeply marginalized communities in India, Brazil, and more recently in Nigeria and Namibia. And what I've found time and again, and which has allowed me to take this position where of how it is a moral imperative for us to hope is because if they can hope, then surely we can find hope in the comforts of our home and our you know, very liberal societies in relation to their uh, situation and stable societies, right? So um, it is a deeply humbling experience. And, um, you know, and when you see the reasons for it, it makes a lot of sense, intuitive sense, actually. So one is that, you know, there is a lot of aspiration. I mean, you have to just think about this. 90% of young people in the world today live outside the West. That's nine zero, 90 percent of the people. And young people are have that young people mindset, which is basically they deeply want to self-actualize. They want to find themselves. They're teenagers. They, they really are in a pathway of self-discovery, right? And they have deep aspirations and they don't want to be their parents and grandparents. They don't want a farmer uh, doesn't want to be, you know, a farmer's kid doesn't want to be a farmer. Um, uh, you know, a maid's uh, kid doesn't want to be a maid. Like they have bigger dreams, right? And so they're carving, them, they're carving positions for themselves because this happens particularly because they see that, you know, there are limited choices in their real world life. For example, uh, deep patriarchal societies, which is majority of the global South in many regards, you know, is quite crippling because there's very strict social norms and religious norms dictating your everyday physical life. Then there's also a question of actual physical spaces, right? A uh, majority of people live in very confined spaces and it's uh, multi-generational families living in a single home, often a one bedroom home. So they don't actually enjoy, you know, a kind of privacy. 
So all this comes together. And in relation to that, they feel like digital, the digital has more possibility for self-actualization. So this is Neil Renaud. Uh, they are a village influencer and they have taken on the opportunity to really self-actualize coming from a village in uh, India and to be able to play with the raw materials around them to come up with new fashion trends. And what's really fascinating about this is that they are one of the biggest you know, influencers in the fashion world, overtaking many of the typical fashion brands, right? And one of the techniques, uh, not just with Neil Renaud, but many of these kinds of influencers in the global South is that they recognize that they are going uphill in terms of the battle because English is not their main language. They are often semi-literate. So they intrinsically and deeply audiovisual and they consider themselves global citizens. So they're constantly paying attention to global trends. They see themselves as global citizens. And here's something very interesting. Uh, BBC did a massive poll across the world on you know, who sees themselves as global citizens. And majority of uh, people in the global South saw themselves, call themselves a global citizen. But in Europe, for example, the French, the Italians and Germans, less than 30% call themselves a global citizen, right? Um, also another foundation, so of RK Foundation did a survey of Gen Z for about a decade, right? Across 20 countries on the perspective of well-being and found that China and India had the highest percentage of young people who thought that the world was getting to be a better place. On the contrary, in Europe, many young people feel that the future is deeply bleak. And this is really interesting is between the report found a clear division between the optimism of the so-called developing world and the pessimism of the so-called developed world, right? And a most recent UNESCO report in 2022 found that youth, and this is a hopeful message across context, understand that building knowledge and en engaging with each other through technology is one way they can get out of the pessimism that is pervasive across board. And so there was consensus across 43 countries uh, that digital access and digital spaces can be a driver towards hopeful futures and a push against authoritarianism. Right, and this is amongst young people. So let's not forget that Europe is an aging society, much like mo most in the West. And so this is a reflection of the future generations that is intrinsically optimistic. So um, you know, um, in fact, uh, uh, so UNHCR um, uh, designed uh, their 2021 work plan on my uh, theory from my book on the next billion users about digital leisure as being the pathway to the internet for the world. Because, you know, I was trying to push back against this idea that there's sort of a double standard where young people in the West are allowed to actually be driving uh, themselves online through leisure, you know, in, in terms of social engagement, entertainment, sexual uh, needs and desires versus those in the South are meant to be more utility driven. They should check for crop prices, learn English and be good citizens, right? And so the idea of pushing for digital leisure for all was this idea that leisure spaces are not just some sort of peripheral needs, it is a fundamental need because it's where you really can self-actualize, right? So you, we, we did this really cool study. Uh, our team, um, at Erasmus and UNHCR partnered on, uh, you know, how does that play out in a forcibly displaced uh, context in uh, amongst Venezuelan refugee youth in Brazil? And the reports are online for free to access for those who are interested. And here's a snippet of the kind of optimism, right? So th these are two voices. One is a homosexual uh, Venezuelan a young person who uh, said that a picture I took expressing that I felt very lonely, that picture made it to the top. Uh, 20 people loved it. I liked the picture because it was the only one in which I felt I valued myself. It was that uh, it was with that picture that I understood that I have to value myself as a person why he was so enthusiastic about digital media. 
And this is a, the second quote is from a woman, uh, a Venezuelan older woman, who said, my dream is to make videos because my story is hard to tell. I went through five surgeries and God lifted me up. Many people are in the same situation. I had two heart attacks and God raised me up and many things happen. There are things I want the world to understand because you have to understand, uh, you know, that a lot of these people have not had the platform and I've been like, as David Leon had said, you know, is that there is a need to put visibility back on the uh, digital geography map because we enjoy that kind of visibility that most of the world don't, right? So they finally get to be seen and heard through digital media. So hope always is in context, right? And as I mentioned, context is oftentimes the way you live. In fact, according to the UN, uh, you know, uh, 1.6 billion people live in informal settlements in very precarious conditions, and that's going to double in the next decade or so. And so privacy is a luxury that few can afford, and they live in one-room houses, as I mentioned. And so in relation to that, uh, they actually enjoy more privacy in digital spaces, right? Because otherwise they are watched by their family, their friends, their neighbors. And so here they have a potential to be something more online, despite the risks. Or they can be much more, they can find alternatives to the future of work because they can be creators, they can play around and carve out some kind of monetary prospect because the government and other entities are failing them systematically, right? And this is a guy I had met in uh, Almora in the Himalayas doing field work where he was playing around with, you know, uh, different ways to come up with, uh, actually it started off with him putting himself on the matrix uh, figures just for fun and him being playful in the space of leisure, which gave him the idea of why not come up with a way in which I can come up with matrimonial sort of photos by mixing and matching and photoshopping it and using new kinds of AI tools also later on. Um, now, the, you know, in, in uh, academia currently, the market is a dirty word. It's almost like capitalism is a swear word. Um, what is very fascinating is that, uh, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, countries coming from post-communist regimes see capitalism as a counterforce to the communism mindset. So it's a matter of calibration. It's not that uh, these the, the capitalism as an entirety in a very cliched singular notion is adopted, uh, you know, uh, unthinkingly. Obviously, it is, you know, indigenized in ways that make sense to the context at hand. So in many ways, it is liberating because it is seen as finally giving, you know, uh, a chance for individuals. I come from uh, India and my grandfather was part of the license fraud, which is basically where uh, very few people were given the license to do business. And then it created an entire regime of corruption because you had to go through that person. It was not a free market. It was not capitalistic at the, in any sense of the term. And when it changed in the 1990s, it did create much more prosperity, obviously with also the negativity of markets, right? But the market per se, the ideal of the market, of the free market, is something that we can't just throw away because we think it's distasteful in academia. In fact, I got reprimanded uh, at a keynote, like on Twitter, sometime back uh, when I was at the Computer Human Interaction Conference in New Orleans. And they're like, oh, why is she, you know, uh, promoting capitalism for these young people because they are being extracted and exploited as customers. And one thing is I want to remind them is that, you know, while we in the West have enjoyed or we take for granted that we are customers to companies, in fact, we're constantly hounded with ads, et cetera, it is a luxury because the majority of young people are never, actually, majority of the global South are not treated as customers because they're not, they're considered a high risk market. So they don't get catered to, nobody is selling it to them. So they have to pay the poverty tax of paying twice or thrice more, you know, for goods and services than you and I. And so to be considered a customer is a progressive thing because then they can fight for customer rights. Then they can actually see that they're being catered to, right? 
So things have changed and things are changing. If you just look at the creator economy, which has been led by young people, and remember 90% of young people live outside the West, is that they are being driven by Brazil, China, India, Mexico, Colombia, right? And they are gaining a lot of power and the barriers of entry are low and it allows for a lot of prospects of new kinds of futures of work that is being driven by these uh, young people. So how do we pop that pessimism bubble is through, you know, three spaces of hope to understand that we need to resuscitate optimism, not because we think it's a good idea and itself, but it is a moral imperative because we cannot afford not to, right? Because this is a pessimism privilege, as I said, like it is a privilege to keep that mindset. And as academics, we owe it to ourselves to go against our most beloved theories, most beloved uh, you know, uh, uh, trends, which is all about the doom and gloom, so we can be mobilized. But that doesn't work that way, right? Uh, because it is crippling younger scholars. Uh, I, I genuinely believe that. Because then they even ask the kinds of questions which are already predetermined in terms of to what degree are young people being exploited? Or in what ways are you know, communities feeling extracted and being uh, disempowered. So it's already steering them in a negative loop versus a much more open-ended set of questions. The second element is about repurposing tools. We have to understand that, you know, uh, the hope is about repurposing because repurposing can also allow for rescaling and scaling in measures. For example, people worry that, oh, well, um, you know, how can we, uh, and because I engage with a lot of uh, tech companies and trying to, uh, uh, you know, work with their teams, equity teams, and how to build responsible and inclusive designs. And a number of them say, well, but it's not scalable. We're worried it's not, uh, you know, it, it's too niche. And one of the things about repurposing is that, say, supposing you're catering to someone with one arm, right? And you're like, ah, but that's such a tiny percentage of people. But what if you were to see that what happens in a particular context where you only need one arm? Which are the groups and contexts and conditions require somebody to use one arm? And then you can start to think of other ways, like uh, where these situations play out, like a mother with her child, you know, trying to go down the stairs in a train station or someone who's on the cycle or someone's on the car. So the point is there are many different situations which evoke the need of just one arm, which allows for scalability. And the third is we do need to reconcile a contradiction because that is culture. We live in intrinsically contradictory spaces in a way which makes us complex and also basically human. And, you know, Behind that contradiction, there can be consensus. There can be a sense of, you know, a consensus of hope, a consensus of optimism, and a consensus to break out of this pessimism paralysis, which I believe is the only way forward to a hopeful future. So with that, let me stop. And I'm looking forward to a conversation here. I hope you can you hear me yes yeah. uh, we have a microphone I hope that uh, this will work well now um, so I'm, I'm, I can see you <laughs> I tried to, again with the camera they said it's intelligently and moving but ah yeah no <laughs> so <laughs> sorry for that so um yeah uh, questions please Helen And it would be nice if you introduce yourself uh, before posing the question. Hi, can you hear me? Hey, um, yeah, I'm Helen Kennedy from the University of Sheffield. Uh, thanks very much for your really inspiring talk. I can really relate to what you're saying about how you get positioned when you critique, critique. So thank you very much for saying that out loud. Um, I've got two comments that maybe you want to uh, respond to. 
I, I direct a, a new network in the UK that's called the Digital Good Network, and it asks what does a good digital society look like and how do we get there? So my comments are coming from a kind of similar place to, to where you are, but here comes the but, uh, two things. First, it's complicated, right? Uh, in, a, in my new role on the Digital Good Network, you know, we, we find people saying, oh yeah, I also think the digital is good. Can I join your network? And, you know, we have to acknowledge the many uh, real world, very serious harms and consequences of some deployments of the digital. So the digital is good is, is too simple, I think. So I think the challenge is to hold in the brain all we know about the bad and the harms and what goes wrong while thinking about what kind of digital future do we want. Um, and then the second um, comment, which maybe relates, is I'm not totally convinced that there is a binary. Um, you know, there is definitely critical scholarship and there is definitely scholarship that kind of identifies agency or identifies practices we might feel hopeful about. But maybe a lot of us do a bit of both. And uh, some of the scholars that, that you kind of reference have also kind of done work on, you know, social and community groups kind of, you know, co-opting analytics and stuff. Folks that do work on kind of bad uses of the digital by governments, also work with advocacy and activist groups or otherwise um, kind of acknowledge agencies. So I wonder if it's more of a sort of spectrum than, uh, than a binary. So I was in, interested in your responses to that. Sure, shall I go ahead or how are you doing this? Uh, yes, are you please. taking other? All right. Uh, thank you so much. And yeah, you know, okay, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up because actually I do write about that in my upcoming book about this whole AI for good. And I'd love to connect with you and talk more uh, because I think it's a really important set of observations. So um, one of the points I, I bring up about the AI for good movement and other such is that you know, uh, it has been uh, first the majority of the AI for good initiators in Silicon Valley, something like 85 to 90 percent are driven by Silicon Valley entities in this tech philanthropy sort of uh, push and financial political economy. Right. And so that is very uh, fascinating. And I critique this notion of goodness. Right. Because unfortunately, it has this sort of legacy, which is uh, you know, comes from uh, development studies, you know, international development studies post-World War II and, and a response to post-colonialism, which was a sort of very paternalistic that we will make, you know, Global South good again, <laughs> you know, and uh, we have the tools at our disposal. And when I speak about the binary, and you're right, I mean, there is agency, and you know, if you think about academia in a very simplistic sense, that those who focus on structure and those who focus on you know, agency, those who focus on the top down and the bottom up, right? There's always that kind of thing. But what was interesting for me is that to see which disciplines, uh, you know, sort of take hold and uh, development studies has always uh, been that, like, like if you look at um, development studies, it's a driver for these sort of good mantras because of the kinds of audience they have which is, uh, you know, uh, think tanks and aid agencies that have to say that they're doing good, right, in a very paternalistic way. They're going in there and, you know, uh, and out there to the global south to improve their lives and, you know, uh, help them in socioeconomic uh, ways. But if you look at uh, media studies, for example, and other kinds of disciplines, it's deeply critical. It's, it's so uh, disproportionately critical, right? And so it's a matter of discipline. Uh, business studies tends to be more optimistic and development studies. And most importantly, the global South gets relegated disproportionately to the development studies. And this is mainly the argument I'd like to make in terms of the binary, because yes, there's a lot of scholarship and nuance, uh, much more so than the binary, but mainly towards Western contexts and groups 
But when it comes to the global South people are like, well, it's not our field. You know, you should go into development studies to look for answers or have reviewers. And this plays out in knowledge making in very boring, but very fundamental ways. For example, it takes my PhD six to eight months to get one reviewer. Also, we find it almost impossible to get reviewers who are interested in reading if we're not applying to a development studies journal, for instance. So we can't even get out of our discipline, whether we want to or not. Uh, this is the same thing with conferences. It, it's an uphill battle, right? And so I think uh, knowledge making itself is, uh, you know, uh, is uh, positioned that way. If you look at also grants, uh, whenever I apply for European grants, if I want to bring in a global South actor, they're supposed to be voluntary because uh, European mindset right now in amongst grant agencies to, you know, uh, policymakers is, you know, the European values, the European everything, as if the data chain starts and ends in Europe. And this sort of uh, in, uh, dishonesty uh, that we uh, that we are immersed in is going to derail the kind of funding, which is massive, you know, towards a sort of fictitious solution on AI EU regulations for the world, right? So, I mean, so anyway, there's a lot one can just say, but I think there's, we need to understand that the normative is the global South. Right. And it is not something on the peripheral. And we I think there's a huge struggle to think in those terms, whether it's policy making, because we see it right now from AI regulations in China. So it's a China AI pact to European AI pact that just got released. Why do we have the prefix of the Europe or the US or China or India? How is that global? And yet they claim it's for global regulation. Right. So, um, yeah, so I, I think these are just some points, but I, I'm really happy to talk more because I think the initiatives that are being done in that direction are very important and we need to engage with each other on this end. Karina? Thank you. I'm Karina Mikunen from Tandre, Professor of Media and Communication Studies. And uh, uh, thank you, Paya, for, for the great, great talk and, and uh, talk provoking in many ways. Um, and uh, I think that the idea that, or the question, who can afford pessimism is, is quite important. Um, and, uh, and something we definitely need to think about. Uh, I think also that the, the kind of uh, critical work is not necessarily cynical. So, so when we do critical work, it also kind of sends hope. Um, but my question actually is about, because I think many of us who've done research in this field uh, absolutely agree that that um, social media is important for for many people, particularly many my people in in minority positions, and and it gives them possibility to for self expression and and also uh, forms of activism and so on. Uh, but I think the, the sort of empirical contradiction we face also in our work that we see the positive, but we also see the, the kind of problems in, in, in the structural aspect. So I think last time we met and discussed, I think uh, we discussed the, the, the three basic program on Facebook in Africa. And now I'm thinking, what's your take on it now? Because then we, we discussed it as a kind of example of, of digital colonialism. And, and I'm wondering how would you approach that, those uh, kind of structures and, and the way tech industry works um, from the perspective of hope or optimism? What kind of research would you kind of uh, promote in, in connection to, to that kind of program, such as the, the free tech basis? Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, this is, um, th these are good questions and uh, it's good observations too. Is So um, 
you know, when it comes to data colonialism, right, um, we have to take that metaphor in its truest form because, I mean, metaphors, of course, are very useful because it enables us to, uh, you know, uh, imagine the unimaginable in uh, particularly spatially, right? Whether it's like it architects spaces which are very abstract uh, cognitively and otherwise. So, but there's also a simplification. So colonialism, if we go to the truest, uh, uh, you know, uh, form uh, from the past and, uh, uh, you know, particularly by engaging with historians, we realize that there was a lot of complicity by the state Right, like India didn't just get colonized, for example, for two centuries and was a pure victim. In fact, a lot of the Indian rulers worked very closely with the British companies, right? And the British government per se didn't have that much power in the first century almost because it was a corporate entity for, which also fits into the whole commodification element. But there was a lot of, uh, you know, uh, complicity involved from the local and the global. So we can't even think in these binaries of the global south as victims, you know, and the global north as like the perpetrators. And so that's a sort of, um, there's a lot of discomfort that we are asking us to embrace, you know, uh, which is very unpalpable. Um, and the other element is, for example, what if I were to say that uh, Facebook is a great thing in comparison? I, I would be like, imagine saying that I, I have five nice things to say about Meta. Actually, if I ask somebody in academia saying, say one thing which you like about Meta, I, 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 it's it's always fun for me is that they they really like I think they stomach churns so and I would like to put us in that uh, sort of position and put our students in that position because it's the only way for academia to start being nuanced and keep being nuanced because that's our job we're the only uh, group that can do that you know more so than others with many vested interests. Uh, so, for example, when I say, okay, think of one great thing Meta is doing, even in a context like Africa, is because it forms a counterforce to extremely authoritarian regimes. So state governments, I mean, authoritarianism is on the rise and majoritarianism is on the rise across the global south. In fact, neoliberal democracies are about five to seven percent of the world uh, world systems. So we are in the luxury position of being in that kind of context, right? So when you have an authoritarian regime, which is deep state power, and this is a critique on surveillance capitalism, not that it is wrong, but that's disproportionately emphasizing the corporate power because coming from the American mindset and not from state power, because if you think about how Europeans think about the state, they generally trust the state. If you think about Americans, they're expecting the state to regulate and rein in corporations, right? But it's the opposite and oftentimes in the global South where they feel that in order to stand up against a very powerful state, which is all encompassing, right? The You have to have extremely deep pockets and a sort of kind of uh, a multi, a, a state which cuts across states, right, which are multinational corporations. And so, for example, if you see the context of India, where, you know, Twitter was able to dismiss some of India's, you know, requisites to take down some of the protesters' profiles, right? Or in Pakistan, where they demand that you, uh, you, you know, companies, uh, you know, cooperate with them to give over uh, those who are blasphemous. Now, these are the points where we can start to look at technology companies and say, hey, you know, let's call, let's use our position of power, which is that we are in a liberal democracy and we expect you to do better, right? So don't throw away, don't be evil as a byline and don't say, oh, there's no point. No, actually, this is an alternative state. And that's what a lot of young people look at these technology companies because it's always in relation to what they're facing up. Uh, against, which is deeply crippling. So that's one of the arguments is that it, it's a very distasteful direction that people don't want to go in, but it is a reality that we need to, the, the sort of geopolitics is a deep reality. And oftentimes when we talk about the binary, it's not about yes and no, it's more in academia, it's more of a matter of emphasis, right? So when someone does a focus on 
Western young people, right? Like say I, I, I decide to do my studies on a young group of teenagers uh, in Boston. And I, of course, never say in the U.S. because we don't do that, right? U.S. is the norm. So you never see a title of a journal article saying young people's media usage and hope in Boston or in the U.S. But if it's in Bombay or if it's in uh, Nigeria, you have to qualify why and where, right? And then basically, it's not wrong to focus on it. It's just that majority of our resources, our minds, our energies are going into these contexts and concerns and uh, situations. And, and then what happens is inadvertently, we apply them to the rest of the world when it should be the reverse, right? If majority of young people, a majority of people are living outside the West. So I think it's a matter of emphasis, which is what I'm uh, pushing against where we need to diversify our context, diversify the kinds of questions, diversify the starting points of our investigation so we can have a much more uh, vibrant scholarship for all, actually, right? Um, yeah, but I'll stop there, yeah. Thank you. Karina, can you give the mic back? I hope a very short question, we're running out of time. Actually, more than a question, please. Uh, Mark Hartman, Berlin University of the Arts. Um, I also want to thank you for the really interesting and inspiring talk. Um, but there was one point that I wanted to pick up on, which is the digital leisure divide that you mentioned, which I we also found in our research on homeless people's media and homeless people in Berlin and their media use. Uh, and it's exactly that thing that there is an expectation of functional uses uh, in the policy work and everything around it, rather than entertainment or other kinds of leisure. Uses, uh, but that's actually what is happening. So what people do is much more based on the other side of you. So one is that binary. Um, but the problem I have with both of them, I mean, so in support of that divide, but then there is an ambivalence that you experience as a researcher that kind of promoting that that's what they do is at the same time also kind of keeping them in their position in a way, in, their, in the state that's not really moving them forward. I'm not sure whether that's very clear, but there is an ambivalence towards this sort of confirmation of those leisure uses, but also the problem that the leisure use does not get you out of that really difficult position of being homeless. So there is, and, and that ambivalence I haven't found a solution to in a way, but maybe that's the nuance you're probably talking about. And the second brief point about that is that I think we as media researchers partly support this as well. There's definitely a lot of uh, literature in the digital divide section that actually is exactly kind of reproducing this idea of functional use as the one that we're looking for. And I think that's a sort of a reflection on our work that we need to take into consideration as well. Where do we support these kind of divides? All right. Uh, so thank you so much. And I, I'd love to uh, please send your study if you can to me. I mean, uh, via Twitter, LinkedIn, whatnot, or, or, yeah, or, or email. <laughs> so I always forget that also. So anyway, I'd love to uh, read more. But he, I, I, quickly, because I know I think I have a minute, uh, is that leisure, basically, uh, uh, it's funny, whenever I talk about focusing on leisure, even to uh, aid agencies, think tank, they, there's a sort of a, a gut level that, oh my God, you're trivializing something as heavy as poverty by focusing on leisure and not something which is instrumental, you know, because they really desperately need that, right? And this sort of evokes a sort of hierarchy of needs, Maslow pyramid, like somehow that they have to fit through this, even though it's deeply critiqued that they have to go through the fundamentals first before they can go into the higher order thing like leisure. But, you know, where we can really learn and where I've really uh, drawn from in my first uh, earlier books, like the leisure commons, which I had written about, and uh, more recently, the next few users, is that leisure is a fundamental pathway to multiple areas, including, few, uh, you know, coming up with new employment opportunities, coming up with ways of protesting. And there's a, a lot of rich scholarship in the essay from the Chinese Internet Studies group on, you know, the quiet uh, sort of criticism of, uh, against authoritarian regimes through audiovisual memes and like the whole meme culture, meme activism, you know. So leisure is a very uh, powerful space. And in fact, uh, the British 
have a sort of uh, really honed in on the leisure studies area, which really makes leisure as a very critical space actually for multiple activities. It's actually the starting point. Uh, for example, the speaker's corner in, uh, you know, in the British uh, urban parks, which are used as a metaphor for the internet, like virtual parks as leisure uh, digital, uh, you know, or the urban commons as a leisure digital commons. And the idea that these spaces can be used to, you know, uh, really express uh, the full spectrum of human needs and concerns and desires than more from a more utility driven point. And uh, we can talk more later and connect later. But uh, thank you so much for these questions. And I'm, I, I do feel really sad that I can't be there in person because it would have been really lovely to have this conversation in person, especially after the coffee break. But um, well, I hope next time. And uh, thank you again. So thank you very much, Aurora. Uh, hi, okay. Bye. Thank you very much also for the positive uh, outlook. And we have now the lunch break and don't forget your batches for the lunch, please. Thank you. Bye.